Well, this might be the first element I've done most people know from smell alone. If you were a regular swimmer as a kid, the stench of chlorinated pool cleaner is probably burned into the very fibres of your brain. A horrible miasma of disinfectant, veruca plasters, and sick. The active component of most chlorine-based pool cleaners is hypochlorous acid, a weak acid that's just strong enough to kill microorganisms in the water at low concentrations, but not strong enough where those same concentrations would pose a risk to human health. Chlorine-based cleaners are cheap, but they come with their fair share of drawbacks. Chlorine-treated water can irritate your eyes and throat, and can lead to allergic reactions in people with sensitive skin. Hypochlorous acid also reacts with colouring agents in fabrics and hair dye that can result in a washed-out look after a few chips of the pool, especially if you don't rinse yourself off in the shower afterwards. Incidentally, the chlorine smell in swimming pools I railed against mere paragraphs ago is not the smell of elemental chlorine, but of trichloramine, an irritating gas that fumes from pool water when hypochloric acid reacts with nitrogen compounds in our sweat and other bodily fluids. Not only will the urea in your pee react with HClO, making the water a more favourable environment for waterborne bacteria, but the byproducts will slowly tear gas everyone else in the pool, assuming you haven't pissed on them as well. Under standard conditions, elemental chlorine is a greeny yellow gas, and like its little sister fluorine, it's an absolute nightmare to work with, because it very happily forms hydrochloric acid, or HCl, when exposed to water, a strong acid that's about as safe as an overnight babysitting service ran by Fred West. In chemistry, an acid, more specifically a Bronsted acid, is a substance that dissociates in solution by donating a H plus ion to another species, usually water, which accepts the ion to become H3O plus. Weak acids, like hypochlorous acid, aren't too fussed about donating protons, and will only undergo partial dissociation, leaving the system in a state of equilibrium. Strong acids undergo nearly total dissociation in the presence of solvent, and in hydrochloric acid's case, dissociation to Cl- is so favourable that the reaction practically never runs in reverse. The Bronsted acidity or basicity of a solution can be measured by its pH, which which in simplified terms is a measure of the concentration of H plus ions in the mixture. Now, proteins, you know, those squishy things that biochemists like to faff around with, are very sensitive to changes in pH, and strong acids or bases will irreparably denature them. If it gets near your face, chlorine gas will react with the water in your eyes, mouth, and throat to form hydrochloric acid, which will eat through the tissue in your respiratory system faster than a dog with worms on a plate of chips. Chlorine gas is so horrible that it was actually used as a chemical weapon in the First World War, first by the Germans and then by the British, albeit with mixed results. Because chlorine gas is highly water-soluble, it could easily be accounted for with gas masks, or in a rather disgusting pinch holding a urine-soaked rag over your face. It's also light enough to be affected by the wind, as the British found out to their horror at the Battle of Luce. The chlorine released from the British gas canisters was blown backwards towards the Allied front, whereupon it immediately sunk into the British trenches. To understand the murky history of gas warfare in the First World War, we must look back on the life of a German chemist by the name of Fritz Haber. Haber is best known today for the Haber-Bosch process, a revolutionary and industrial synthesis for the production of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas, which can then be used to make artificial nitrogen fertilisers. The Haber-Bosch process ushered the industrialised world into a new era of food security, saving billions of people from the clutches of starvation. Despite asphyxiating gases being technically banned by the Hague Convention of 1899, Haber knew the British and the French were already experimenting with chemical warfare, and he turned his talents into finding a weapon that would end the war immediately before more lives could be lost. Haber's choice was chlorine gas, and he converted his research institute into a full-blown chemical weapons research lab. The team at the Harbour Institute went on to discover a whole rainbow of syntheses for gruesome chlorine compounds. One such example is dichlorodiethyl sulfide, known to you and me as mustard gas. While exposure was rarely immediately fatal, mustard gas would blister the skin on impact, leaving the victim to die a slow and painful death as their gaping sores gave way to fatal infections. Harbour was convinced chemical warfare would force the Allies into quick surrender, and usher in as bloodless a victory as possible for the Central Powers. But Harbour was wrong, and when Germany surrendered in 1918 after four gruelling years of warfare, his reputation would never recover. After Germany's defeat, Harbour was derided by the scientific community as a war criminal. When he was awarded the 1918 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on ammonia, many of his peers refused to attend, with two previous Nobel laureates returning their prizes in protest of Harbour's nomination. When the value of the German mark crashed like a zeppelin made of gingerbread, Harbour lost most of the money he had made from his ammonia research to hyperinflation. Like many other Jewish academics, he was forced to flee the country after the Nazis took power in 1933. In a cruel twist of fate, an insecticide developed by the Harbour Institute called Zyklon was the base for Zyklon B, a chemical weapon used to execute millions of concentration camp prisoners in the Holocaust. Had Harbour kept his hands clean, he would likely be universally lauded as one of the greatest figures in the history of chemistry, up there with Lavoisier, Mendeleev, Pauling, and Dr. Bunsen from the Muppets. 
The Harbour Moss process helped usher in a standard of living that would have been considered utopian in the 19th century, but the chlorinated stain of his chemical weapons research will never fade from Harbour's legacy. Chlorine is an element with a pretty dodgy history. Since Harbour's day, people have realised using chemical weapons on people is, surprise surprise, a bit messed up, and restrictions on them have been strictly tightened internationally. These days, chlorine's uses are much more benign. Sodium chloride, for instance, a compound you can check out in my sodium video, is absolutely necessary for animal life as we know it to exist. But chlorine potential to harm people has never truly gone away. In 2014, a hotel was evacuated during, of all things, a furry convention, after an improvised chlorine gas canister was set off on the stairwell. Luckily, no one was seriously injured, but the culprits were never caught. To this day, there's a bit of confusion in the furry community whether this was intentional or just a prank that got out of hand, although if it's the latter, that raises a few disturbing questions. Alright Barry, alright Dave. Listen, we thought it'd be funny to pull a little prank on Steve. Great idea! You start flooding his room with neurotoxin, I'll start loading his pets into the smoothie maker. You guys want to hear something spooky? Me and a few friends at Kronk Games have been working on a terrifying Halloween supplement for Dungeons and Dragons. A cool new race of creepy toy creatures called the Fizzwigs, and a self-contained one-shot adventure called Escape from the Junkyard, featuring mad sick art from Maisie Carter. And also me, I guess. It releases November 4th on the DMs Guild. Buy them separately for four pounds. We'll get the whole thing for seven pounds. Then you have an extra pound coin to spend on spooky accoutrements. Now go into the haunted woods before the skeletons catch you and make you join their party. Oh no, one of them's a rules lawyer. Oh.